Okay, for today, we are talking about the review for chapter two. And the first thing here is description of a function with a metaphor. The whole topic is basically about functions. The domain of range of functions, how you can tell if something is a function. That's like the main stuff that's on this test. We have special functions called piecewise functions. Those I kind of describe them as a Franken function. So it's a lot of this is about functions. So what is a function like? It's like a machine. And if you put in an input of like two and, and a six pops out, it's totally fine. It doesn't matter. It could keep it the same. It could change it. We don't have any rules like that. Like you can't put out a zero. No, you can have any output you want for a, for a given input. But if I put in a two again and I get something different, like a seven, do you get that that breaks the rules? And so that would not be a function. There's a couple other ways you can tell if something is a function. Uh, from ordered pairs, like if I say 2 comma 7 and 2 comma 6, right there I've already broken the rules because one input had two different outputs. One that confuses people sometimes is that if I get like the same output for different things, like 2 gives me 7 and 3 gives me 7 and 4 gives me 7, people feel like that's not a function. But it is. No, it hasn't broken a rule. It's consistent. What well, would break the rule is if I put in a 4 and it comes out something different than a 7 now. Because it already came out with 7 once, it comes out with 8 now, breaks the rule. All right, what's the other way you can tell if something's a function? Raise your hand if you remember that other way. Yes, sir? Vertical. vertical line test. So you'd have to graph it quick, and then it would pass the vertical line test if, when you graphed it, let's, let me do an example of that, like this, would that pass the vertical line test or not? No, because a vertical line drawn like this, when going over it, what you're doing is putting in an input this whole time. Like right there, I'm putting an input of, let's say, 7 or whatever's on the x-axis. This would be 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And if I put in my vertical line and it ever touches twice, what I've got is an input that has two outputs. All right. So uh, next topic. There's a third way. What's the third way to tell if something is a function? I was kind of weak on describing this in the first place, so I'm going to definitely take a moment to explain this. Um, I said that you can't just say, if you can write an equation for it, that it's a function. Here's the definition officially of, uh, of an equation. You can't just say, because there's an equation, it's a function. But if you can solve the equation for y and only get one equation, then it's a function. Let me give you an example. Do you remember this equation? It wasn't y equals x squared. It's different. It was what? It was what? y squared equals x. Okay. Now, what did I just say a second ago? If you can solve it for y and what? And get a single equation. So I can solve this for y, square root, square root. And I get absolute value of y is uh, square root of x. And a lot of people don't know that. They just think, oh, it's just y equals square root of x. And so they can solve that in their head and get just one equation. It's wrong. They're supposed to be getting what? Plus and minus. They're supposed to be getting two equations. That's why this one, this is an example of one where you've got a something that's not a function because you haven't solved it for y and gotten only one equation. That being said, if I can solve it for y and only get one equation, then I know that it's a function. Okay. Now, just take a second here and say to yourself, oh, wait, actually, this is really complicated. Let me just keep it to this. Solve that for y. Got an answer? Cube root, cube root. And why did I do that? Because I wanted to get y alone. Why don't I have an absolute value on this one? Another way to say that is you can have cube roots of negatives and you don't have any problem. It's okay to have negatives. So therefore, we don't need an absolute value. It's only when you have things that are squared or to the fourth power or to the sixth power. So this one can be solved. Y is alone and it's only one thing and it is the cube root of X. Now I know you don't even know what that graph looks like. 
That's not a requirement that you know what it looks like. The requirement is, can you solve it for y and get just one equation? If it ends up with a plus and minus in front of it, like those other kind would, then you got two equations. It's not a function. All right. So enough talking about that on the concept list. Uh, family of functions. Okay. Uh, so, oh, pausing a second because somebody just walked in. All right. So, oh, pausing it. Okay. So back to uh, family of functions. What is a family of functions? Give me one family that you know. Yes. Okay, that's a family. And if I wanted to take that and move it a little bit, it would look a lot alike, but I could go like this, right? Do you remember all the different things that you can do to these functions? All right, so if I did this, here's a more, most complicated one that I can think of on short notice. That's a plus. You should be able to tell me, actually I'm going to change this to an 8 so that, a little forgery there, so that uh, I can have different numbers for each thing. You should be able to tell me with that, 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 actually it's the 8, and that, are all going to do to my parent function. If I were you, I'd write this out. And underneath it, I would write in each thing. And if I, if, when I tell you, tell you the answers, if you had it wrong, I'd fix it. Let's pause for a second when you give that a try. All right, so here are the changes. Number one, I would want you to know high vo. Horizontal on the inside. This is a horizontal on the inside, both of those things. Okay, and the things that are on the outside, they're all verticals. Vertical things on the outside. And this one is a vertical reflection then. It makes it flip up down. So if this is a parabola, it's going to look like that based on that. This is a vertical stretch three times taller than it used to be. You can trust the things on the outside. It seems like it's three times taller. It actually is three times taller. Uh, and this is on the outside again, and that's just an up five. This one right here is a in, inside, so therefore horizontal, and a horizontal, not a stretch, but a horizontal what? I said reflip. What's the official name for that? Reflection. Good. That is a horizontal reflection. And by the way, if you horizontally refl reflect a parabola and you rotate it like around this axis, you know, it'll end up in the same spot. See what I mean? If it's at the origin anyway. So the moral of the story is, and it makes sense, if you have something like x squared and then I make it, oh, I'm going to put a negative on the inside. Do you get it does absolutely nothing because you're going to square it anyways? Okay, so that's why when you reflect a parabola, it doesn't even move. Uh, on horizontally, to clarify, and it has to have not moved vertically because if it had moved like over and then you reflect it left, right, it does move over. Okay, so it, it's a little complicated. That's if under the assumption that you do things in the right order. All right, back to this one. That is up. No, it's not. That's the most common mistake answer. That's left. And it seems like it should be right because adding something to something should make it move this way because those are where the positive numbers are. But things on the inside, you can be careful with them. They're often counterintuitive. Okay? So one last one on the inside. Let's say I do this. Seems like it's a horizontal stretch factor 2. That's the most common mistake. Shrink, because you can't trust it. does the opposite of what you'd think. All right, that's enough about families of functions. There's, uh, just to clarify, there's multiple families. Uh, here's another family. What's that? Absolute value. You're supposed to know... 12 of them. You got notes that go over all 12. I don't think you really wanted me to burn up all the time describing what they look like because you can look back in your notes and recover all 12 of them. There's nice little pictures of them and the domain range and all that stuff. All right. So let's save our, our review time for other stuff. Next thing um, domain and range with A and B. Okay. So if I were to take this function and say y equals x squared, I hope. 
getting me the domain and range of that would be child's play. Uh, but what if I were to throw in a minus a, where a is greater than zero? Would you sketch that for me and then tell me its domain and range? Yes, sir. Okay, don't, don't, don't tell me verbally. Sketch this on your paper or your virtual paper. This is under the topic of domain and range with A and B. Now, for this one, I'd like you to compare yours with the kid sitting next to you. What I asked you to do is sketch it and say the domain and the range. Okay, so these first row one and two have somebody across, row three and four have somebody across, and row five and six, you guys just have to make a trial and you'll have somebody across. All right, there's your original, right? What does this minus A mean? Am I for sure moving down? Yeah, only because it says A is bigger than zero. Okay, if they had let A be negative, if they had said A is less than zero, then I have negative, and this number is going to be a negative, and then it would have actually moved up. But that's not what we did. Okay, so this is moving down. How far is it moving down? Well, we, we know. We just don't know what it is. We know it's A, right? Okay, so I could say that it is down from where it was, how far? A. But then I wouldn't call it A. I'd call it that spot would be negative A. So when you're doing your range, hopefully you said negative A. Again, I would challenge you to say any number on that below zero there, it has to be negative whatever the distance is. This says the distance has to be a, A has to be a positive number. You can't just slap a 3 down here. That doesn't make sense. So you'd have to say negative A. So domain, still from negative infinity to positive infinity. The range would be from negative A to infinity. And can it be negative A? No. no. Yes. It says equal to. Equal to it. So therefore, yes, it will be it. I know what you might be thinking of is the ones on the homework where it would say just greater than. So if it, this had said greater than, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I might be wrong on this. A is greater than zero is a positive number and it might be like 2.3. No, 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 I'm not wrong on this. You're going to move down. You used, here's the way you can tell. You used to be able to touch it right there, right? You used to be able to touch zero, right? So if you move it down exactly A, then it is touching A. Does that make sense? If it was touching here, it's going to be touching there because it, it's moved down exactly that distance. Yes, A is anything greater than 0. So you pick a number. Say you pick 6. I'm going to move it down 6, and it'll be touching 6. I know what you're thinking of is the homework question, which was different. The homework question was a one where we had uh, f of x. Let's talk about this one just for a second because it confused a lot of people. And it said that uh, it was going to be equal to A when X was greater than or equal to 0. And then later they said, oh, by the way, A has to be greater than 1. On the top part? Okay, tell me this top part. What's that say? 1 over X plus 1. Okay, good. And that was when X was what? Greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, and what about this bottom one, A? Yep. What were the directions there? X is greater than or equal to zero. Is that correct? Or was it X is less than zero? Okay. X is less than zero. Thank you for getting that cleared up. Okay. So then, to do this one, we have to say F of X is 1 over X. Remember, F of X is like Y. So I'm going to say y whenever I say f of x, because it just helps me to graph it. y is going to be 1 over x plus 1. Well, what's 1 over x look like? 1 over x looks like this. Plus 1 means move it which way? To the left 1. There we go. I moved it to the left 1. And now I'm only supposed to do that when x is greater than or equal to 0. Here's the dividing line then right down here. x is greater than or equal to 0 is only this way from there. 
So this part has to be erased. Okay, so this was not going to be there because that function doesn't exist over there. It only exists when x is bigger than 0. And or equal to 0 means it does touch right there. It's going to work. Okay, so now how about the stuff that's going this way? That's the stuff that x is less than 0. So then this just needs some interpreting. f of x is the same as y, right? And then they say that y is going to be equal to a. y equals a. And then they say a is bigger than 1. So can you then transfer that over and therefore say y is bigger than 1? It's just logic. If f of x is y and y is equal to a, and a is bigger than 1, and y is really equal to a, then y is bigger than 1. Okay. So if y is bigger than 1, Here's y equals 1 right here. But I'd have to make that a dotted line at y equals 1. And then where is bigger than? Bigger than is above. There we go. That was a really complicated one. But it, it wasn't that bad once you can transfer and say, oh, so f of x is really y. y is equal to a. And a is bigger than 1, therefore y is bigger than 1. If they had just told you y is greater than 1, it wouldn't have been an honors class. That would have been the easy way. Yes? Nope. You've got to do a dotted line at 1. Nope. Don't do that. If I want to say a is greater than 1, what you're trying to tell me is I should pick some number a little bit bigger than 1 and say a is greater than or equal to 1.1. But as soon as you pick that number, it's not right, because you can get something that's a teeny tiny bit smaller but bigger than a. So, no, you can't do that. Stick with the dotted line at y equals 1, and then shade everything above that. Okay, stop talking. Yes? If it was y is equal to a, then you would pick a spot and have a solid line there. But it's not. It's greater than. All right. So moving back to this. Uh, actually, I never finished. Yeah, I did. I gave you an example of a uh, domain with an a and a b. All right. Piecewise functions. That's kind of what we were just doing there is piecewise. Let me give you one more piecewise function. Uh, f of x is equal to, I'm going to make it. Three different things. It's going to be x squared when x is bigger than 3. It's going to be 2x minus 3 when x is between 1 and 3. And it's going to be 1 over x plus 2 when x is, uh, let's see, what's left? Uh, Less than 1. There we go. Okay. So if I ask you to figure out f of 2, you should be able to look through this and figure out which of these three functions would apply. I can't do this one because it only works when x is bigger than 3. 2 is not bigger than 3. So I throw that one out. Can't do this one because I can only do it when x is less than 1. My x is bigger than 1. Therefore, it must be this one. And therefore, it must be 2 times 2 minus 3, which would be 4, minus 3, which would be 1. Raise your hand if you would add 1 on that one, too. Okay, good. Now, figure out for me f of, uh, let's see, a plus 2 if, let me see, this might really mess with your head, but I'll see if we can do it. A is less than negative 3. If you're asked to say something is greater than a certain function, you can shade it in. What you're saying then is the answer is bigger than that function. So yes. Don't 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 go any further. Sorry, we got a lot to cover. 
I can't go into super deep on an unusual topic. But even if it's interesting to you and me, <laughs> sorry. If there was, I, I wouldn't be telling you. Sorry. I can't tell you what's on the test. That was one thing you asked me. Then the second thing you asked me is to go in, in depth in something that I feel, I, sorry, I have to choose what I feel is relevant and important. And your question is interesting. But you, I think you get there's infinite number of interesting math questions. And I only have so much time to explain them. You can, of course, come in on Monday morning if you want. We can talk all you want about that. All right. Here we go. Monday, attend, just a reminder, Monday is, the, uh, is a day you can come in for math help. And it's, the test is that day. So, of course, if you want extra help, you can come in Monday morning. All right, here we go. So f of a plus 2 if a is less than negative 3. So if I put in a negative 3, for example, or something less than negative 3, like negative 4, do you get I will end up with something like negative 2? So which of these three options, a, b, or c, should I be using? C. Because I'm trying to figure out f of a negative number, this is the only area that would work, things that are less than 1. So I got to use this part of the function to evaluate that. Okay. Now I don't know what a is, so I have to just put in a plus 2 into this function. So you should have said 1 over, in where the x was, you put a plus 2, and then I say plus 2. Final answer, 1 over a plus 4. How many of you got that without my help? Good job. If you didn't, I hope you can see that this told me which of the three functions I could use. Because I knew I was going to be sticking in a, a largish negative number, then I knew for sure this was going to come out less than 1, so I knew for sure I had to use that function. Then all i got to do is stick the a plus 2 right there. Okay. Moving on, uh, implied domains. This is a very simple one. Uh, I would like you to set up the two things you need to set up on this and then make me a number line to give me the domain. If the test asked for interval notation, you'd have to do that. If the test asked for uh, set builder, you'd have to do that. But I'm going to say number line's fine for this. Honestly, number line is my favorite way of doing these. I'll pause for a second while you do that. So here we go. You should have said this part right here is underneath the square root, and therefore x minus 3 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. This kind is on the bottom, and so you should have set x squared minus 1 not equal to 0. Raise your hand if you set them up right. Okay, good. Next part. you got to add 3 to both sides. x greater than or equal to 3. That was easy. This, I, if you can factor it, you should. And then you'll have x plus 1 and x minus 1. If you didn't notice that, you could have tried to solve it and then do the square root thing. And then you've got to remember you're going to get two answers, plus and minus 1. Okay, so then if I graph this thing, I have negative 1, positive 1. And this one was greater than or equal to 3. Here's a 3. So it can't be this and it can't be that or it's going to poison my function. And it can be. See, this is not equals that I just did. It can be and should be bigger than or equal to 3. So here's 3 and bigger than that. So final answer is just x has got to be greater than or equal to 3. Now I could have made this even more complicated by making one of these holes appear over here at like 5, and then you would have had to have a gap here, and then you'd have, if you were doing interval notation, you'd say like, it works from 3 to 5 with a parenthesis on the 5, and then it works from 5 to infinity with a parenthesis on the 5. That's another way you can do it. All right, that's enough of the implied domain. A lot of things to know. Uh, next is making functions. Let's say I want a function that's going to multiply by 3, then uh, divide by 4, and then add 2. We're going to call it f of x. Make this function, this mythical function, that will do those things in that order.
All right, so here we go. You should have said f of x is equal to an s. We're going to make it a really boring function. We put like a 2 there, but we're not. We're going to make it more complicated. f of x, we start with an x, and then we're going to do some stuff. Times it by 3. Does it matter if it's 3 in the front or the 3 is after the x? No. It's just technically we like to write it with the 3 first, but it's not wrong if you have x3. All right, then divided by 4. All right, so I'm going to put divided by 4. And could I have also done divided by 4 this way? Sure, that'd work. All right, why, why is it better generally to do a divided by 4 this way? Because it'll force the thing on top to be done first. Okay, but, but it's okay uh, to have had divided by 4 later. And then plus 2, plus 2 like this. Now let's make sure it actually does it in the right order. Does it really, when looking at this function, does it really multiply by 3 first? Yeah, because you'd be forced into the fraction first. And with Because did you know this? A fraction is like having parentheses on the top and the bottom. It forces you to do that just as if there's parentheses there. Okay, then of those two, the multiply would happen first. And then the divide would happen next. Divide by 4. And then the last thing is plus 2. Yay, it's in the right order, so it's right. That's building a function. All right, next one, real world function problems. So I give you a function, f of x is equal to 3x to the third plus 2x uh, plus 7. And I say that f of x is like the height, and I say x is like the time. Okay? I'm not saying this is an actual formula that you could use in the real world for height and time. Question? I didn't say it was going to work, okay? I just said this is your function. It doesn't really, really matter what the function is. Now the hard part is just if I tell you a time, you better know where to put it, and if I tell you a height, you better know where to put it, okay? So imagine for a moment that this is the, uh, that the height here is, and I agree, obviously this can't be, a, I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit. It still isn't going to be right for a uh, function, but it's going to be better at least. And if I really want to make it better, better, I'm going to make it on, like, some planet where they actually have gravity. So that's going to make this go up and down. Okay, so there's a better function. Now, x equals time, and f of x was height. What if I said I want to know when the thing was at 20 feet? Just set it up. Don't solve it. Just set it up. When was it at 20 feet? Did you just put a 20 right there? That's what you should have done. Because f of x is the height. So we put a 20 there. How would you solve that? Well, I would subtract 20 from both sides and get it equal to 0. And then there's a lot of ways to solve quadratics. It's the number one easy way. Factor. Otherwise, x equals b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All right, good. And... Uh, there's even another way. If I graph both sides of this, graph that, graph that, and see where they cross, that will give you the answer too. It's a very powerful way for the ACT. I've, I have estimated that on about five of every ACT test, at least five times, you could solve the problem by just graphing both sides and seeing where they cross. That works. Now, some of you may have never been told that before. X plus 7 equals 12. Would you agree the answer is 5? Guess what happens when you graph y equals x plus 7 and y equals 12 and you see where they cross. Where do they, they cross? At x equals 5. Yes. It's true of any two equations. Graph both sides and see where they cross. It's really powerful because you, you probably wouldn't be able to answer this one. Uh, y equals sine of x uh, plus 7. And over here, uh, I make y equal to uh, um, like uh, 2 unless you're better at this than I think you are. You probably couldn't do that in your head, but you could graph both sides and see where they cross. And what if they never cross? What's the answer then? No solution. All right. Good enough. You've learned something about how you can solve real-world function problems. Uh, back to that real-world problem. If I, instead of told, telling you the height of 20, what if I had said, I want you to use time is zero seconds, as in we didn't even, before we started. Yes, what would you do? Good. It would be 7. Apparently it was starting 7 feet off the ground in this problem. All right. Okay, good enough. Uh, now let's talk about 
solving f of 0 and f of x equals 0. Those are called the x and the y intercept. The y intercept is where x equals 0. If you don't know that right away, you better write that down. The y intercept is where what? x equals 0. And the x intercept is where what? Y. Okay, so let's say I said this was my equation f of x is equal to x squared plus 2x. What's the x-intercept and what's the y-intercept? This was on your last test. Okay, so if you want the x-intercept, what should I do? So y equals 0. That means this is 0. That means I have 0 equals this. And I just told you two seconds ago, two great ways. What's the easy way? Factor. And actually, graphing is pretty good, too. But you don't have a calculator right now. So I'm factoring out the x, x plus 2. And now i got my two answers. What are they? 0 and negative 2. Okay, so those were the x-intercepts. And if I want to make them x-intercepts, they're where y is 0. So I could go like this and then say 0 and negative 2. And this happens to be a spot it touches at 0, 0. Now, just think about that for a second. That makes it both an x-intercept and a y-intercept, right? If it's touching at 0, 0, you know where that is, right? That's the one spot where you're an x and a y-intercept at the same time, okay? So, and when I ask you, what's the y-intercept? To where x equals 0. You just put in a 0 here and a 0 here. Or you could have just been smart and gone, oh, it's touching 0, 0. So that's an x-intercept and it's a y-intercept. Okay. Now, for just a moment, I'd like to ponder some of the tough problems that were on this smart board uh, that was pre-prepared here. Um, this one is tough enough. I'm just going to briefly explain it to you. If this distance is x and this distance is x and they're equal to each other, how would I go about finding the domain and range for, just let's start with the perimeter of it, the distance around it. Would you agree that the minimum distance around this thing is 4 plus 4 plus some really tiny x? What's the smallest that x could be? x could be, well, almost infinitely small. Would you say that, therefore, the, uh, the distance around this, the perimeter, with the smallest it could be, would be just over 8? Okay, so the perimeter of this would be just over 8. Okay, x is greater than 8. Uh, and what's, if we're talking, you know, the domain here uh, for the perimeter, um, what's the smallest that it could be? Well, sorry, what's the biggest that it could be? Now, you might think you could put anything you want in here, but at some point, do you get that the thing is going to be all splayed out like this? You can't have a gigantor x. In fact, think about it. What's the biggest possible distance you could have and have it all flattened out, but still kind of a triangle? Yes, ma'am? Okay. Are you saying this is 8 and this is 8, or are you saying both of them are 4? Ah, so you're saying x... Okay, so the perimeter can get as big as, or as small as 8, or as big as, if these were both 4s, it would be 8 plus 4 plus 4, which is 8 and 8 is 16, but it couldn't actually be 16. So it could be between 8 and 16. All right, don't worry. That is really challenging, not something I would expect you to pull off on a test. This next one, absolutely. You should be able to do that one, no question. Find the, the uh, where f of x equals 0. f of x equals 0 is, which is that, the y-intercept or the x-intercept? That's in the x-intercept where y is 0. So if this is going to be 0, how do I make this whole thing equal 0? I'll give you a hint. If the bottom becomes 0, the whole thing's going to crash, so you don't want that. What do you really want then? You want the top to be 0. So you just have to set square root of x plus 12 to be equal to 0, and you solve. You square both sides, you subtract from both sides. Uh, what does x have to be? Negative 12. 
There you go. Okay, and then what's the domain? The domain of this puppy is you set this part. What's the, what do you do with roots? Greater than or equal to zero. You set that part, what? Not equal to zero. That's how you find the domains. And this part would factor. Can you tell me what it would factor to? X plus 11 and X minus 11. Okay, good. And on the top, you just set X plus 12 greater than or equal to zero. Solve minus 12 minus 12. X greater than or equal to negative 12. And my advice is to always put it on a big number line then and merge it all together. So I know it's got to be bigger than or equal to negative 12. Here's negative 12. But I also know it can't be negative 11, empty spot, and it can't be positive 11, empty spot. So then I'd have to clean this up. This does not work, and that does not work. So it goes along and until it doesn't work here, and then it goes along until it doesn't work there, and there we go. So I'd have three little sections, I'd say. It works between negative 12 and negative 11, but not touching negative 11. And then in this little section, it's working between negative 11 and positive 11. And here it's working from 11 to infinity. All right. And this one is a piecewise function. I've called them a Franken function at the bottom of the page here. And uh, this one, you would only between 0 and 2, which would, if you're having a graph, it's between 0, which is right here, and 2, which is like right here. In that little zone, it's going to be this parabola. An upside down parabola that's been moved where? Plus one. No. Plus one means up one. Upside down parabola shifted up one. This is how a normal parabola upside down looks. But this has been shifted up one. So I'm going to go kind of like that. And then in this zone between negative three and zero, which is like in this little zone right here, I got a graph x minus two. X, Y charts are handy for this. X and Y, figure out what numbers I could put in. Maybe I want to put in a uh, something between 0 and negative 3, like negative 2, and see what I get. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. Negative 2 comma negative 4. Just, just relax. The bell will ring when it's time to go. I'm trying to cram in all the possible review I can for you. You have to take the test Monday, not me. Yes? There is nothing that's newly assigned right now. Now, I know you know that I've done quite a few homework assignments and haven't collected those scores. I will be asking for those during your test on Monday. Okay? Now, we haven't graded some of them. I can't get scores for those. But be prepared to give me homework scores on the ones we graded. Have a great day. It's all I have for the video for today.